Welcome back to Physics 151 Online. Now that you know a little bit about heat engines, in general we're going to look at a specific kind of cycle, a specific kind of heat engine that has significance because it tells us how ma maximally efficient a heat engine can be. As we talked about last time, the second law of thermodynamics, one of the forms that it can be expressed in says that it's impossible to completely convert thermal energy or heat into work. There's always going to be some inefficiency in that process. Even if we get rid of all of the practical inefficiencies like friction or thermal losses. And so uh, this is called the Carnot engine or the Carnot cycle named after a young French engineer who almost 200 years ago first worked out a formula for the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine. And once again I'll just mention that the science of thermodynamics and the laws of thermodynamics came about because people were interested in practical problems. They were trying to figure out how to improve the efficiencies of engines. So <clears throat> what Carnot's contribution was is that he th thought about the kinds of processes that could happen in order for an engine to go around a closed cycle on a pressure volume diagram and he figured out what kinds of processes would have the maximum efficiency and he expressed this by saying these processes would have to be reversible. In other words that they could happen both in the forward and the reverse direction without any violation of laws of nature. And some processes as we've already discussed are processes that we don't see in nature and we call these irreversible. We never see them happen in reverse. So although friction uh, uh, mechanical en energy can be converted into friction we never see uh, thermal energy uh, converting right okay sorry let me just start all over again uh, we see frictional processes converting mechanical energy into heat and that we do see in nature but we never see that happen in reverse and that's you know the second law of thermodynamics heat can never be conver converted completely into mechanical energy we've also discussed in a previous video that uh, heat never uh, gets transferred in the reverse direction from a cold to a hot object if we take a hot object and put it in contact with a cold object heat always flows in one direction and not the other and then a process in which the working substance like the gas inside of a cylinder with a piston on it if that gas does not remain in equilibrium uh, all throughout the process then that's something that won't happen uh, in the same way in reverse as well so Carnot was able to use these ideas about reversible processes to figure out well on a PV diagram then what kinds of processes could we come up with that would be reversible and that would give us the maximum possible efficiency. So to devise that kind of an engine that has only reversible, pro reversible processes, we can't have any frictional losses. We have to have the condition that all heat transfers occur isothermally, right? Because if, if a heat transfer occurs uh, between a system and its environment that are at different temperatures, then that won't be reversible and therefore it won't be the maximally efficient kind of process. And the working substance has to remain in equilibrium throughout. Practically speaking, the way that this could be done is to make the process happen slowly so that the gas inside our cylinder that makes up <coughs> a model for a heat engine, so no matter what happens, every point in that gas system would be at the same pressure all throughout the process. That's something that's violated routinely in the real world, but that would represent one of the conditions to have the maximum possible efficiency. So since these conditions are really impossible to meet exactly, this idea of having a reversible engine is a little bit like the model of an ideal gas or considering motion without any friction. We know that there's always friction, a little bit anyway, in the real world, but we can understand mathematically how the motion would behave in the absence of friction and use that as a model for understanding real systems. So we can come close to reversible behavior by minimizing the kinds of things uh, that might happen that would be irreversible. And studying that kind of a system will give us the maximum possible efficiency. And then we can use this as a benchmark to compare the efficiencies of real world engines. So here's where the rubber meets the road. We have to use Carnot's conditions to figure out what this cycle would look like on a PV diagram. 
And the main clue is in the kind of heat transfers that we have to have. All heat transfers have to occur isothermally, which means when heat comes in or is released, that has to happen along an isotherm. And so that is something that we can easily come up with on the next slide. Uh, an isothermal process, such as you have along an isotherm from point 0.1 to point 0.2 on this PV diagram, is one in which heat flows in and it's used to do work. And all of the heat goes into doing work. I know that because this, the first law of thermodynamics says that the change in the internal energy is Q minus W. And if you're on an isotherm along the, the line from 1 to 2, that means the internal energy doesn't change. So heat is absorbed and completely converted into work. Now that doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics. Remember the second law of thermodynamics says you can't c completely convert heat into work in a closed cycle so that you could do it over and over again. But along an isotherm, for an isothermal expansion from 1 to 2, heat is absorbed and completely converted into work. Now, in order to create a closed cycle, we have to drop down to a lower temperature and then go backwards in the opposite direction to return back to the initial state 1. So what's the best way to do this? Well, we would like to do this without releasing any heat. Right, because or absorbing any heat, because we said that all heat transfers have to happen isothermally, and to get down to a lower temperature, we have to jump from one isotherm to another. So if process two to three is adiabatic, if it's an expansion but it happens adiabatically, that means no heat is absorbed or released. And notice that we're still doing work. So to go from two to three adiabatically, it still represents a slight expansion. So work is being done. And that's great for efficiency. Now, here's where we have to pay the price of having a closed cycle. And that is, we'd like to go back from 3 to 4. Uh, it turns out that heat is going to be released in this compression process from 3 to 4. But if we do it isothermally, right, then the heat that's released will be at a constant temperature. And we said that's one of the things that has to happen for an iso, uh, for a, a reversible process. So 3 to 4 happens along an isotherm at a lower temperature than the isotherm from 1 to 2. And then finally, from 4 to 1, we get back there adiabatically. Once again, it represents a compression, but we do it in such a way that there's no heat absorbed or released. And that means that the process is reversible. So all of these processes, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 back to 1, they're all reversible processes. And therefore, this cycle can be used to represent a reversible engine. So let's now calculate the efficiency. And let's uh, realize that we have two temperatures in this system. We've got the temperature for process 1 to 2, and we'll call that T1. And since that's the higher temperature, we'll call that TH. And then we've got the temperature at 3 and 4, which are the same because 3 to 4 is an isotherm. Clearly, that's a lower temperature. So we'll call that temperature T sub C. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we can use our knowledge of the first law of thermodynamics to find the efficiency of this engine in terms of those two temperatures. Remember efficiency <coughs> is the work done divided by the net amount of heat absorbed. Here, the work done, because in a closed cycle, delta U is zero, so the work done is just equal to the heat absorbed. So that's the heat is only absorbed in, uh, it, sorry, it's not the heat absorbed, it's the total heat. Uh, the, the total Q around the entire cycle. So QH plus QC is equal to the work done. And remember QC, uh, it, that's the heat that's released, and so that's actually a negative quantity, divided by the total heat absorbed. And looking at these processes, we know that that only happened when Q came in along process 1 to 2. So we call that QH. So the efficiency can be written as 1 plus QC over QH, and now what we need to do is use the first law to find what's QC, and that was that was how much heat was released from 3 to 4, and what's QH, which was how much heat was released from, or absorbed from 1 to 2. And I'm not going to go through the work to do that, that's outlined in your textbook how you would do that, but you've already done problems like this where you rely on the first law, you calculate how much work is done in the process, and then by understanding the internal energy change, you can find the heat that's absorbed or released as well. And I'll just show you the answer. When you find that ratio using the first law of thermodynamics, you find that it's simply related to the ratio of those two temperatures with a negative sign. And the negative sign is there, of course, because QC 
is a negative quantity. So that's the result that Carnot was able to obtain, so we'll now call this the Carnot efficiency. We're going to use the general formula for efficiency, but plug in this special relation, which is only true for a Carnot cycle. And you'll see we get this really simple equation that tells us the maximum possible efficiency for a heat engine that's operating between a high temperature and a low temperature reservoir is equal to TH minus TC over TH. And looking at that, you see that that is always going to be less than 1. So that's the maximum possible efficiency, and it's noteworthy that this result is independent of the working substance. Okay, so whether we have an engine that's based on a gas, or whether it's based on a liquid, or some other substance, uh, it, it doesn't matter. This is the maximum possible efficiency that we could have. One thing to note is because of the fact that these calculations relied on the ideal gas law, the temperatures that are expressed here are in Kelvin. So don't make a mistake and use these uh, temperatures in, in degrees Celsius uh, to try to do the calculation because you'll, you'll make a mistake. It'll be wrong. So let's just do a very simple example where we're given a heat amount of heat that's absorbed and amount of heat that's released for a heat engine and calculate the actual efficiency of the engine and compare that to the Carnot efficiency just to see how efficient the engine is. So here's a heat engine absorbs 500 kilojoules from a reservoir at 2000 Kelvin and releases 200 kilojoules to a reservoir around room temperature at 300 Kelvin. So you can see that the difference between these two, 500 minus 200, that must be how much work was done. So let's calculate the efficiency. Well, W uh, over Q absorbed, right? So we've got QH plus QC over QH. So that's 500 kilojoules. QC, since that's a release, that's negative, minus 200 kilojoules over the total amount absorbed is equal to 0 0.6. So that's an engine uh, that's a 60% efficient engine. Let's calculate now the Carnot efficiency. So that's simply going to be 1 minus the ratio of the high and the low temperatures like this. And the answer that we get if we plug in the numbers we're given is 0 0.85. So actually this engine doesn't do badly. Uh, it's 60% uh, efficient and the maximum possible efficiency that you could have had and again, what that means is if we got rid of all the irreversible processes, so no friction, no thermal losses, all the heat transfers happening uh, at the same temperature, the system remaining in equilibrium, if we could conquer all of those practical challenges, the best that we could possibly do would be 85%. So this one's not bad. And, and again, I want to emphasize the difference between those two. Uh, that's due to these practical factors like, like friction and heat losses. And in principle, we can improve that 60%, but we can never get any higher than 85% because that is a fundamental limitation of turning thermal energy into work. The second law of thermodynamics tells us that there's an upper limit on that, and that's why this 0.85 is less than 1. So I hope this has been a helpful introduction, and now you have a little better understanding of what a Carnot cycle is and how the efficiency of a Carnot cycle is an important uh, property because it tells us the maximum possible efficiency for a heat engine. I'll see you in class.